Hey, we are back with another podcast from Kenneth Yar Studios with Richie Carter and Lauren Ferrardo and myself, Morgan Cogri. Uh, today's podcast is brought to you by Heart of the West Art Show on Sale, uh, August 11th through 13th at the Bozeman Grand Tree Inn in Bozeman, Montana, and uh, September 1st through 4th in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho at the Coeur d'Alene Resort. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit, or at least start off the conversation, um, talking a little bit about um, the difference between, in fine art, the difference between an homage and a copy. Uh, plagiarism versus originality, um, how you define that and how you walk that thin line um, that, that artists have been walking for thousands of years, basically. Um, yeah, and as we speak, Ken and Richie are setting up a still life uh, of a gun with bullets yeah. and cards. What's the title for this one, guys? Uh, Richie's in the hole, what was it? Yeah, something like that. That is homage to a country song, but yeah, you gotta have Ace in the Hole was a <laughs> George Strait song I like, but I don't know if that'll be the name or not. Sometimes you can figure out a name before you start, other times you gotta kind of finish it off and you can tell a little bit more then, but it'll be something about the Ace, I really want to focus on the, the playing card up there stuck behind the barrel, and that could be a fun storyboard piece to it, but I don't have it all figured out yet. Richie would probably something cool. I'm gonna try to talk while I paint today. Well, don't My try goal. too hard. Okay. <laughs> try painting too hard? No, don't try talking too hard. Don't try more important than you focus on your craft. Uh, I'm gonna get better at it. Painting's easy. Talking's hard though. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it is. Well, I was just thinking about this because uh, I'm not sure. I guess we were just at um, in Great Falls for Western Art Week. Well, last week, uh, or was it two weeks ago? Now, I guess. It was like a week. Yeah. Yeah. It was two weekends ago. Um, and uh, Western Art Week's a big gathering of Western artists in Great Falls, Montana, based around the Charlie Russell Museum. And uh, Richie and Ken were both exhibiting artwork there. And we did a, a brief podcast from the, the venue. Um, they were exhibiting work in hotel rooms. And they had collectors coming through and looking at work. And so many collectors. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and. Uh, one of my close friends from uh, high school bought one of Kenny's Little Kenny's. Yep, that was pretty awesome. Um, <laughs> in the, he does sort of a silent auction model for them where you can write down what your bid is by $10 increments and they got it and it's a beautiful little piece of clouds and it was their first art purchase, original art purchase as a couple. And they were in the middle of closing on a house at the time too, so it's pretty awesome. It is your decorator. It's gonna be. It's not gonna fill a lot of wall space. <laughs> six, 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 so. <laughs> I've got some work to do, but let's put a really big frame on it. Right. But that's yeah, that was really cool. Now, it's always a good good show, but definitely crazy. And in regards to the topic we're we're talking about, it's always challenging when you go and see so many artists and so many artists different types of work that you you can't leave there unaffected by it and you definitely there's aspirations you see or things that you start to admire about your own work or others you really it's beneficial but definitely pulls in some of that debate a little bit about whether or not something is entirely yours and I don't think that really is the case with art a lot of the times people want to make it about them because that maybe helps it sell or something but Ultimately, we're all in this together on some level, and we're all experiencing the world in a similar way, especially as visual artists. And the similarities are beautiful, but simply just to copy it is pretty lame. And I think there's, there's a fine line there, but it's yeah. always cool to see what other people are doing and, and to be affected by it. I think something that, that people love, non-artists, non-art world people love about artists is that is imagining all these crazy ideas coming out of your head, original original ideas all the time. Yeah. <laughs> and realistically, that's that's not how it works. Just like anything else in the world, you, you, you look yourself. back at... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you look back at, at, at other... There's a lot of history behind it, and uh, 
I, I mean, I've certainly had the moment where you say, oh, if I could only paint like that person, I, I would be Oh sad. yeah, oh yeah. But that's not what people want. People want you to put your own style on it. Um, that's true. But, you know, if I could paint like Clyde Aspervig, that's what I would just do that. I wouldn't do two. That's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, he's a good guy there. Uh, yeah, uh, Robert Henry is a guy that wrote a book called Art Spirit that I really like. And uh, one of the lines I remember pretty distinctly from that book was talking about how the pursuit of this craft is really a pursuit in beauty. And it's been going on since man ever started drawing on cave walls. And to acknowledge that it's a, like he calls it a brotherhood. And I thought that was just a really cool way of thinking about it in regards to it not being me against them or somebody better than another one. It's like we're all experiencing the world in different ways. We're all trying to share it, how we're seeing it in some way. And if you can look at someone's work like Clyde Aspervig and see that it's popular, see that it's well received, then that's, that's great. But don't let it interrupt your own way of seeing the world. And that's, I think, the hardest thing is not to let that really affect you negatively, but use it positively. And I don't know. It's, yeah. It's hard like, to it, can be, it can be really discouraging to see. Yeah, it's like, uh, really yeah, like you said, I could paint as well as I want to paint in my mind, I would just paint like Clyde Aspervig, but it's, it goes beyond that sometimes to how you want to design pieces and what you think is important can be can be different, so you just gotta try to know that you have to do it differently or else you'll get sued by Clyde Aspervig. <laughs> well, that was another question. Okay, so you painted, uh, what was it, one of the beers? Oh yeah, beer paint. Yeah, it's still life like we're doing now. Yeah. And because there's a brand on that, there's copyright. There's copyright issues. involved. But I mean, it's your own composition. It's your own still life. So what is what is the uh, mm. what are the rules? Yeah. What are the rules? Did you find anything? Else? Somebody was calling you up for that, right? Saying, oh yeah. My dad. Or... Yeah. Was, well, well, Steve. <laughs> Steve thought it was not a problem. I was oh, definitely okay. under the opinion that. What I was working on still life wise was uh, I mean definitely something that could be brought up in court and more than likely lost so like the the main example is the Campbell's can by Warhol everyone's like, oh, he painted it and he didn't get in trouble legally he absolutely could have Campbell's did not pursue legal things because they enjoyed the free press they got out of it they got tons of basically advertising and they saw it like that a legal battle with some millionaire artist would be tough. Now, if you're going to sue a poor artist in Montana, I mean, they could ruin me instantaneously, but I don't know if they would really spend the time on that in that regard. And they would, again, maybe a company say, that's great that you are using our brand and you're showing it positively. And you maybe get a cease and desist letter, something like that, if they saw it. And made, so I was selling prints for $1,000 each right. on the internet. Well, I think that's where, it, when you start yeah. licensing the image and, and allowing reproduction of it, that's mm -hmm. probably where you get in trouble. But a fine art image, just, I mean, I think... Everyone just basically talked me down out of it being a big issue because of that. Um, but I still feel uneasy about it, no matter what people say. I, it's, it wasn't my intention to use their image negatively or anything like that, but it's for me, it's homage. It's cool. I like the beers. I want to share the design of the logo. And if I sold them for any amount that would make it reasonable to give them money, I absolutely would. But it's just not really that reasonable. Yeah. So... I don't know. It's a still a fine line for me in that regard, but I I think you can't avoid it. That was the other debate of whether or not it's if it's in the world, there's a certain amount of it that's public domain that if it's there, then you know, you can't avoid branding entirely. There's going to be in anyone's picture at some point. We're painting a Ruger right now and bicycle playing cards, but if I make it more about these other the whole composition not being about the Ruger or something then or I don't play up that it's actually Ruger. I don't know. I don't know really the ins and outs of it, but I'm going to try to just keep from being sued. <laughs> and no one wants to be sued. No one does that. Um, I talked to a friend who owns a, you know, we're doing all these beer still lives, and he owns Glacier Distillery, mm -hmm. whiskey distillery. What's his name? Uh, uh, Nick. Yeah, I think I've met him. Mm -hmm. Nick Lee. And he, uh, I just asked him if, I was like, okay, what's, you know, I've been, I've been talking about this, this, uh, you know, 
idea of painting something with a brand on it, these beer bottles, and you know, people have said, no, it's, it's not an issue. It, it, is, it might be an issue if this, this, but like, what is your take as a business owner if someone, you know, if we wanted to do a cool painting of a bunch of whiskey bottles and he was it's like, well, um, he didn't think at all. He's like, I wouldn't be upset as a business owner of it at all. Uh, it'd be actually kind of cool. And I think you as the artist have like, that's fine. Yeah. The artist to paint, you know, you paint what you're. Yeah. And I think paint. that that would be the general business owner's uh, attitude, but yeah. then there's also there's when, all... when lawyers get involved then. Yeah. yeah and corporate, kind of corporate attitude sometimes can be different too. So I don't yeah, know what will happen. Exactly. So. You can do the next podcast when we're in jail. Yeah, so let's advertise this as much as we yeah. can. <laughs> Ken's, Ken's using this color chart. Yeah, looking for some for dark values. I'm trying to establish yeah, some of the darker values first. I like to work from the shadows and into the into the highlights if I can. And maybe establish in the middle grounds. Look like a gun. Oh yeah. Yep. We'll see. Yeah, it's getting there. I'm just gotta slowly Figure out which chart to use. I think that's enough of the ivory black. Let's see what the yellow ochre I got here. You'll watch this painting come along. Ken's will be done in about 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be here till tonight. Or you gonna leave the outline? <laughs> Let's see how it works. That's just different style, different pace. I'm always painting pretty fast. I think it's most of the time to my detriment. The school in New York I went to would built they had a special sheet that went over my drawings that had one inch square cut out of it and they would tape it onto <laughs> my picture again. yeah they yeah they're like no this is what we're gonna do because it's not working just coming over and checking on you they'd see me working somewhere where i wasn't supposed to so they would tape this on there and i wouldn't i wasn't allowed to move it so the teachers the only ones that could take it and move it all around on my drawing and i get do it a square by square i would do it square inch by square inch basically <laughs> and it was well, really good for me, but absolutely torturous. I hated it, and I hated them for it, but I get over it eventually. It's just that, you know, it's that boot camp kind of thing. A lot of people think it's, uh, yeah, come on in, Dan. So, yeah, the fine line between um, a, a reproduction, a, a blatant ripoff, like, say, by, um, I know for my mom's work, she's, she's discovered a shower curtain in Walmart with her prints on it. No way. Oh, yeah. wow. I'd be honored. Yeah. Oh. yeah. And like, where did that come from? Well, probably somebody in China finds an image, doesn't have the watermark on it or anything. Mm. Somehow it's high enough quality for reproduction and then they, yeah, print it on there, ship it out. I, uh, kind of funny story. Am I, I maybe I told the story already. Yeah. yeah. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> um, the in when I was in college, one of my professed couple of them went on a trip to China for ceramics, and uh, while they're over there, they they went to this like factory where they reproduce art, and he brought in he just he was just fascinated by it, and so he he's like oh I'm gonna get him to reproduce one of the painting professor's pieces and bring it back to him, nice. and so he pulled up a picture on his phone. It's like, can you, can you do this? And he's like, yeah, do it. He just did it right up, and they picked it up on their way out and brought it to Kevin. In hours, like in a matter of hours? Yeah, I don't day. know. I don't know the exact timeline, yeah. but I think it was like pretty quick. Yep. And uh, they just brought it back, and it, it was pretty good. I mean, it, it was the color of the photo, but the photo wasn't quite color accurate. It was pretty funny, though. Yeah. Those are the same. That's what ends up, I know, in, in Europe when you're buying like a an original piece of art of say a, a souvenir of a monument a church or whatever that there's a good chance that those when you're buying it off the street at least that those have been painted in china oh, oh yeah uh, at one of those factories huh. where they just they, they're paid they're paid an hourly salary and they, they turn them out and then they get huge markups when they yeah. get Europe. oh yeah every artist dream yeah. well those guys are really good painters they study a lot. Uh, the schools in China are really right. rigorous, and so it's probably not a big deal for them to do that. But selling fine art in China is probably a little more difficult. I don't know. Yeah, it is, and and I think because of a tradition of of essentially imitation is the highest form of flattery. 
they study their masters and they try to get as close to reproducing what that master did. Um, that that's the true mark of your your quality. And now, as a, as a result of that, I think there's a, somewhat of a lack of originality yeah. in the general Chinese contemporary art market. Um, that's very interesting. I remember seeing a we were in Shanghai and there was a, a gallery kind of complex and there was this kind of almost Jackson Pollock view just like drip uh, paint drip paintings but it was the color it was huge it was you know, five foot by three foot maybe and it was like blacks greens and yellows and it was hideous <laughs> and it was like a hundred thousand dollars in the US yeah. um, I think it was like yeah whatever that would be like seven hundred thousand yen, and, and no, there was no demand for that. Uh, realistically, they probably bid up that work, that artist's work, in a sham auction, and then recorded those results, but without a, a real sale in the auction, and then hung it up and hoped that somebody was gullible enough to buy it as a blue chip Chinese contemporary artist as an investment. Jeez. That's yeah, a tough, tough game to play. That's not all there is. There's also good stuff, but yeah. I think a big thing that I've noticed happened uh, with maybe the big change was the internet and marketing, even so artists have a much broader audience than they did before. But where they could personally offer classes before you maybe go to a college and there'd be students that have paid to be there and they would maybe study with that artist, but. It seems now a huge part of maybe a lot of artists' salary or income is to do their own workshops. So they will just adopt whoever wants to pay their fee, five or six hundred dollars, whatever they usually are, and you hang out for a week and paint with this painter. Um, what I've noticed from that is you'll see, you know, four or five artists that really figured out that style of teaching and working with people, and then lo and behold, everywhere there's hundreds of little paintings that are kind of they're not plagiarism they're not cop like they, they really are like their own compositions but they use the exact same palette they use the same brushes they use the same techniques and it looks like you know the other the main artist was intoxicated when they painted it or something you know? like but at least it's it's not their original aesthetic i guess but right. they really associate so much and since they can really for the first time ever and i think they're like bob ross or whatever made it so people could paint with him and see how he works but you know, now you could go see, I'm going to the plein air convention in a couple of weeks and I'll be able to watch all of my heroes paint. Mm -hmm. And a big thing I'm trying to be aware of is that I'm going to want to come home, buy those colors, buy whatever brushes they use and try to imitate them because I really respect their work. But if I'm not careful and I start selling that stuff or whatever, then I'll just become one of these kind of hacks. I'm not really doing my own thing. So, right. but it's, it's, I think a big change in the art education right now is that there's a lot more of that so much access to influence yeah yeah what you're willing to live with i guess oh i'm psyched about going to that yeah where is that in california oh uh, it'll be in tucson actually tucson. arizona um, it'll be cool are there multiple plein air conventions a year or is that just a year i think there's just one big one but i don't really know i've never been to them before so this will be my first real experiment with it cool and you'll, you'll be painting out in the desert and stuff oh yeah well, it's gonna be really cool, and hopefully I can meet some of my artist heroes there and really uh, gain a lot just talking about techniques or their experience, how they get to paint, how they do. The thing is, it's most of the time what I've learned is it's all my favorite painters would just say paint from life, and that's how they got their own thing. Because when you're painting from a photograph, you're seeing everything captured by how that photo saw it. But if you're working from here, like Richie and I will paint this. Or maybe painting from different vantage points, but already we're going to see things differently. We're going to see colors differently. We see everything with our own eye a little bit different. And a photograph will sometimes sterilize that and kind of kill it. Right. So I, I know that's what they'll tell me. And I've talked to many of my artist heroes, and I'll just say, which I paint from life. <laughs> that's like my, when I hear that, it makes me feel so much better because I didn't get a, you know, I wanted to go study at an academy and like all these things to get those things. And I look at all these painters that I, you know, absolutely love, and that's the response. Like, yeah, paint from life. That's the best teacher. So okay. it's it's something that is so um, available to you, really, I mean, anybody who wants to to do it. Somebody just uh, Kelly Folsom, um, still life artist out of Oklahoma City that we all, well, at least me and Ken Richie now. Um, 
she recently posted on Facebook saying, you know, I hate to be negative, but stop copying my work, essentially. And apparently, I guess, maybe she's having issues. I, it wasn't directed at anybody. But then uh, she had a bunch of comments after that. And one, I was reading some of the comments in one of the art, and an artist who I guess she knows um, said, yeah, even, uh, even using photos that aren't your own, it can be considered, uh, oh, yeah. um, you know, copying. Oh yeah, as references. Yeah, if a photo photographer finds your your photo and they're and you're charging five thousand dollars for a painting, they're on some level entitled to part of that. And I know certain artists that will actually work with photographers for that right. very reason. They have artists that or photographers they like their compositions or the places they paint or they take photos of. They just tell them, "Hey, I'll pay you this much for the picture," and they okay, they sell it to them. They can do whatever they want with it after that. Right. I'll use Photoshop if I ever get a photo offline that I'm attracted to. I'll either usually it's like friends off Facebook or something. They went hiked somewhere and I say, "Hey, can I use this?" So yeah. Other times you can get them and use Photoshop to invert them. You crop them. You change the clouds. You change the mountains. You can do all kinds of stuff. That's the joy of being a painter. Yeah. You couldn't do that with a photo probably and sell the, the photo again. But it, by the time it's broken down, I'd show someone the original photograph and it wouldn't look anything like the painting, which is cool. Yeah. It would like pick and choose like what part of the photo and right. mm -hmm. and that that, that parts together from other photographs. Or whatever. I paint a lot of wildlife, and I'm you know I'm not able to go swim in the ocean and get a photo of a sea turtle. So <laughs> yeah, I had to. I did. I had to find different resources and cobble them swim. together. You did get to go to Hawaii. That's true, but I did not get any good photos underwater. So. <laughs> yeah, I think wildlife artists have it really hard because <laughs> that's I mean you're you. To get around I mean, like friends that do uh, African wildlife it's like how often do you get over there and take new reference photos you're Just you go, go and take on a safari. <laughs> yeah you know, take 80,000 pictures trying to get enough stock till your next uh, trip to Africa but yeah hold still you kudu <laughs> <laughs> keeps moving oh. we're pretty lucky to live up here because we get as much landscape reference as we want every right. morning mountains and clouds Mountains and clouds. And water. <laughs> Slightly less uh, moving than, than an animal. Yeah. yeah. Depending on the day. Clouds, that is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit easier. Which isn't exactly why I do it. I just, I'm drawn to it more, but I'm not complaining, that's for sure. Well, the people that do still lives, like we're doing here, on a regular basis, working from a photo just seems crazy to me because you have it all under your control. I mean, this will never change. I mean, we have this light on, our easel set up here, we could work on this for the next year if yep. we wanted to. I don't want to spend that long on it, but plan to. yeah, there's no, there's no time. Yeah, like with a, if you're out playing air painting or something, you're going to be subjugated to 10,000 different types of light over the course of two hours. It's just mm -hmm. the clouds will change, the temperatures change, the, the sunlight, and it just gets crazy on you real quick. So do you think you end up with like an average of all those different types of lights, or do you like try to take a mental snapshot of a certain... Yeah, preferably you don't chase the light. That's kind of like one okay. of those little sayings you heard us talk about. It's like, just don't change. Like, in don't art schools, they don't chase the model. Because every the model's posed differently every time. You get these... If you're doing an 80-hour figure drawing thing, that's going to change so much. And if you don't stick to whatever your original, like, impression was, gesture, all those little subtle things, then you'll end up with this kind of... They look like ghosts, kind of. Like, there's all the edges on the outside are soft because they could never really decide where they're going to put the figure or the change the hands a few times because there's no way the model's going to get it on the same place on their That's hip every time and that kind of stuff. So you just, you have to relax a little bit, which is hard when you're supposed to be that accurate. But 80 hours, you said? Oh, yeah. Easy. Wow. I mean, they, they would do month-long drawings at GCA Maybe. or longer. Oh, look, someone posing in a certain mm -hmm. position. Yeah, yeah, I'd be... Be a long time. I wouldn't be wanting to do it. I never made it to that long drawing. I would do cast drawings that were really long, but those obviously don't move either. <laughs> so you're able to enjoy it. But like that, yeah. Yeah, street performer, a silver guy. <laughs> yeah. But even a couple hours as a model is hard. They'll move because they get breaks every 20 minutes. So especially within the first like hour or two of the drawing where you're setting up the really basic structure, it can be really frustrating to deal with a model that's going back and forth too much or something. So... That's why they do pay them a lot of money if they can, because they, they they're worth it. Every one, of the, one of the models that we get to draw, she's actually like, you know, professional 
model, she does a street performing while she, she'll just stand still for however long it's she... It's a skill. Pretty impressive. Yeah, it, it really is. Okay. I tried it. I did a, a floor show where I was like a... I had a stable position. Um, it was for like uh, uh, cardiography and scientific, you know, uh, what's it called? Sonograms of your heart. Huh. Even just for like 40 minutes, it was like really hard. <laughs> Keep your mind, yeah, from yeah. there. It's a long time. Really? <clears throat> so, like, you were on, like, a... Yeah, uh, off of Craigslist, it was like, yeah, they needed people to come in and get all <laughs> gelled up. Right. And they, like, show. It was really cool. Did they shave your chest? Uh, no, luckily, <laughs> I had already shaved my chest. <laughs> so they didn't do it for me. No. It was a cool 250. Yeah, sweet. <laughs> but yeah, it, was, it wasn't necessarily that easy just to be in one position. So. Right. Well, we get some of these big muscle guys that you think would be so strong, they'd be able to hold a pose. And because it takes more energy for their muscles to do anything than someone that's slender, they'd just be wobbling all over the place and whining. <laughs> and uh, it was always kind of hilarious. Sometimes Gravity they'd, pulls they'd start. They'd start real you know, robust oh, and just right. real, yeah, they're over the top, and then by the end of it, they're just droopy and whining. <laughs> they work that core, bro. Yeah, yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah. They never muscles. They miss the core, <laughs> Dave. I took, a, uh, in high school, I took a class at FBCC, Fly the Valley Community College, a drawing class, and one of the models was this very orange, very built man. Very orange? orange. Yeah, he was really orange. Spray <laughs> tan? He was ginger, and then he also, yeah, heavily spray tanned, and was like all freckly. Do what you gotta do. Yep. Um, but yeah, I yeah. rock orange. Yeah, it was an orange lifestyle. <laughs> <laughs> had like a sepia colored charcoal in it. But yeah, with that, with that, well, I guess I'm not back to some of our original topic with regards to that. In the schools, you're kind of expected. I wouldn't say to copy, but you're. You're trying to make it as accurate to reality as you can. So it's funny, you walk around at the end and basically everyone's drawings look more or less the same. And you couldn't really tell. I mean, certain people just had a way of like handling line or something. You could always tell, oh, that's so-and-so's work. Mm -hmm. But occasionally you just had no idea who did who or who's drawing with who. Yeah. And if you didn't put your name on it, you'd just be like, well, <laughs> like, I guess you'd know maybe from where you were sitting, but it could be kind of crazy to not, not really have that identifiable mark and... A lot of the people that I know I went like, to school with, trying to get into the professional world, where it's all about branding and trying to make your your brand your unique look. Yeah, your style. unique look. It's hard for them because they're very, very, very authentic to what they see. But them and every you know the ten students they graduate with are like that. So maybe you make your own compositions up or something. But ultimately, but you look at the style. They're so close to reality. They're so beautiful. You know, it's not at any detriment to their work or their craftsmanship, but. It's not going to help their it's brand. Not a recognizable style, right? Which I, I don't know. Kind of, my heart breaks in a little bit. I've never was that accurate, so I didn't have that problem. I have enough like looseness and like I screw up enough to make it my own. Mm -hmm. But it happy accidents. Yeah, happy accidents. It's always been really interesting to me, like the photorealistic drawings and stuff. That's like, wow, that looks exactly like a photograph. Yeah. I'm like, I'm not really inspired by it. <laughs> Like it's, I recognize and respect the skill it takes to do that, but it's like, I'm not seeing, I don't know, I think art should be like a, uh, the other end of like the filter that is you, you know, mm -hmm. you show, not just a photograph. You and then, yeah, yeah. But you gotta, I, I do believe you should learn the basics, like you should learn how to do that maybe, right. and then break the rules. Um, mm -hmm. But there's a woman in, in Great Falls that's very popular in the Western art world, uh, Janelle, I think, or Janelle, Jan Something with a J. And she does a book, basically like a bookshelf with like a couple objects on it. And behind it always is a famous painting from Western artists like Charlie Russell or O.C. Oh, yeah, 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 Seltzer yeah. or something. Um, and she had a piece in the, the Charlie Russell uh, show. But basically she does a, a, a phenomenally photorealistic bookshelf with like whatever cool books she thinks Honestly, the older white man will <laughs> be attracted to, um, and this this ancient piece, and it's and it's beautifully reproduced, but it is, it's not an original art piece. It's a, it's a it's an homage basically to that artist, but it's like 
right on. Mm. And I think that's that's an interesting um, angle to, to look at this from. It is is how basically she's painting half of an original painting because like the big, the, the bookshelf is essentially like a still life, mm -hmm. um, but then copying an old painting. Dicey. And they sell for <laughs> fifty to eighty thousand dollars. So it does very well. Yeah. Um, like and they take a long time. I know that they're extremely um, time intensive. So yeah, hmm. they're they're quite beautiful. But no, well, let's find one. The question. He was alive still. We try to wrestle. Say in that regard. Yeah. I probably wouldn't be able to pull that off with the Clyde Aspen big painting or something. Like I could try, <laughs> but I feel like it would eventually end up with yeah. you. It's hard to maybe you sell something for eighty thousand dollars, but in the art world, amongst your peers, you might kind of be held in lower regard, which some artists handle really well. Mm -hmm. I would hate that. Mm -hmm. Like to me, I try to just do my you're, thing. You're an artist, artist. Yeah, and when someone, but yeah, when somebody acknowledges that like what I do is okay or I'm doing right, like mm -hmm. that's what I look for. Like selling something is great validation, but when an artist I admire comes in and says you're doing it right, I like that's yeah, that's, that's what it's about, and. Uh, I don't know, it's easy to say now, but... When I was in school, my teacher, she was, she would say, I don't know the exact phrase, but essentially, like, a good artist, like, you know, copies. And she would, not meaning, like, you just copy someone's piece that they produce, but you, you adopt ideas. And, because nothing is, you know, comes from nothing. Everything comes from something. Mm -hmm. And so... There is no original thought. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, so you know, you, I think I think that's pretty true. As you you know, you see how someone's doing something and you adopt it, and for a little while maybe it's like yeah, you're trying to copy them and emulate. And I think there's a process to that of like learning a new technique or skill, and then mm -hmm. letting it become part of your own handwriting, if you will. Um, but I would like I wouldn't call that plagiarism I mean if if anybody's ever done like a, a study after like you learn you paint a painting from a master's piece or whatever and that process you learn so much within that of just and it's obviously a study after you're not going to go sell that but I painted this but, I think that's a trick yeah but um you do you learn so much from that and so uh, and that's one yeah and that tends to be like yeah because mm. you can't really paint in a void you have to be gathering influences and yeah. learning from other artists. It's, yeah, it's the only way to do it. Which I think was that, that yeah, Robert Henry quote about how it is, like, we're all in it together on some level. But financially, you can't just, I don't know, blatantly lie or something. Maybe maybe you can, but it's frowned upon. <laughs> Works for some, I guess. <laughs> yeah. You guys seen uh, the trailer for that movie that's coming out about Vincent Van Gogh, where each... His frame in the movie is a recreated of the style of his painting. Like yeah, yeah. Hundreds of artists and each. Good. It's like hundreds of paintings per minute, of course, because it's like animated. It That's looks so incredible. Good. Loving, loving Vincent. I think. Loving Vincent. Vincent. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. James, it's yeah. still being made, but it looks out. amazing. Yeah, I saw a trailer, like an informational thing, and it did look very, like very look. neat. Nothing is hand animated anymore. Pretty much. Yeah. Like a more lush, waking life. Kind of. hmm. Yeah, that looked really cool. I will go see that. I will not paint on it, though. So, Ken is doing now some gunmetal gray and reflections of light on the. Amy. Something like that. Richie's still laying in the darks. Oh. The underlayer. Dude. I'm just. Just, this will be something later. I don't know what it is now, but I don't feel like elaborating. I'm trying to get the, the cool thing about this, I guess, is that I'm work, when you work from life, like the, all those great artists already told me, you have to make choices. I don't know more abstractly sometimes because you're you're looking at a more broad reality than something like a photograph where it's already like stagnant. Like I said, you can really play around with things that. I don't know. You, I guess you like more in the moments. So you can really see things differently. Mm -hmm. So I'm able to make choices that I wouldn't usually make. Yeah. But I also usually make mistakes I wouldn't usually make too. So there's. Do you guys ever adjust the thing mid 
painting, adjust the model? So, uh, no, not usually. Not. What will happen is you end up adjusting your paint more because you okay. screw up something, but yeah. it's, uh, it's once it's going for me, I like to just kind of finish it off. Or like, I mean, so this is the second or third time we painted this revolver set up mm. with various objects, and that's been pretty fun to have almost a theme. We're exploring a little bit, trying out different compositions or stories with it. That's fun. But to just straight up change it in the middle is, is pretty frustrating. Yeah. We can did something similar like this piece to something similar to this piece for the quick draw at Great Falls, the yeah, Out West Art Show. Yeah. Called with a shot in it with a well, it's called shot for shot, yeah. And that was uh, about that alcohol being referenced as a getting a shot of liquor came from the old west where you could trade a shot like a 45 round for a drink at the bar right. cool it's not that cheap anymore no but that's just a 45 round um let's see my 40 caliber ammo is about 20 dollars for maybe 50 yeah. yeah so if you could get a draft of liquor for under 25 50. cents, yeah. <laughs> 50 cents. You're in pretty good shape, but... Or bad shape. Well, yeah, be in really bad, bad shape, yeah. Maybe That's more like it. Some Jenka vodka or something. That's good. Yeah. But that's, that was, I thought that was a cool story. And so we set up the still life kind of regarding or around that premise a little bit. And it was fun. It was a cool, cool project. They're both... Ken and Richie are now kind of working on the negative space behind the the gun. How do you not lose that trigger? That's yeah. That's, that's I did that last time. I like <laughs> had to go back in, and it's really just like for me. I'll do a lot of pushing and pulling, and like right now is I'm mean, still really just blocking in, but I don't I don't love the blocking part. Like I I guess I like doing it, but I don't like the look at it. Right. So I'm like trying to just get through. <laughs> yeah, I'll sometimes actually, like my block in, and then over the course of the next while, you just ruin it. Ruin it, yeah, <laughs> and then realize that it should have stopped long, long ago. Right. But see, I like the the block in is where I'm like really figuring out colors, and so there's a lot of colors. I'm like, I have no idea what that is. So yeah, <laughs> so like, hmm. Richie is not using his color charts. Oh, I I am a little, little bit. bit. Okay. I'm kind of trying to. I want to. I've been using them a lot on these still lives uh -huh. to really, you know, get some accurate color going. And I like that, but also I notice now when I go to paint again, like I already painted this revolver in the same light, everything, but I don't even remember what colors I use because I'm using these different mixtures than I would kind of default to. Usually use yeah as I'm trying to make it dark, and so I'm trying to maybe. Find balance between the two. It's all about balance. I'm trying to think of to talk at the same time, so I'm not talking or painting right now. <laughs> Pick one. Pick one. Yeah. Cool. And I'll be Bob Ross. No. No. Yeah, he is. He is exceptional. Yeah, his son did it too. Why? Uh, yeah. Instructional video. Mm-hmm. What was his? I name? watched one recently. What's his name? Uh, something Ross. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Are you sure? Jeremy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Uh, Scott? Because I'm Scott. He, uh, <laughs> um, but he did the same thing, basically, the painter. Oh. His, his dad, like, Bob introduced him, and then he took over the kind of the class. I was thinking about that, that I was in the art store yesterday, looking to just buy some random supplies or whatever I was shopping for, and there was Bob Ross stuff everywhere, like oh, yeah. Bob Ross brand. It's like oh, he's gone, so who's making the money off of him still? And maybe it's his son. That, yeah. That's cool if that's the case. I was hoping it wasn't some corporate media thing. Right. But what what are they like? Kits, kits, like, brushes. I mean, yeah, yeah. Like, his own oil paint. Yeah, yeah. Like, whole... <laughs> I was like, what's that? <laughs> it's oh right, right, right. after right, right. <laughs> <laughs> The Bob Ross Afro. <laughs> yeah, he goes great on campus. The Ross Fro? Yeah, apparently he didn't even like his fro. He didn't want to have it, but uh, people who had, <laughs> had stake in his brand were like, no, you gotta have it. <laughs> oh, that's, that's the Bob Ross. Oh, no, that's. Uh, uh, 
image. She's like, oh. <laughs> He had to have this haircut that he hated his entire really? life. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's why I don't want to be Came famous. Came out of the 70s and just could never change it. Could just never evolve. Like, just put yeah, it on. Just, <laughs> right. A clown wig. Afro wig, yeah. People would know. <laughs> I would know. <laughs> Let's see here. It's all about the voice, though. Yeah. Pain was a lot less stressful for him and his followers. I, I, I don't know. Painting to me is very stressful, so I try to. As it should be. <sighs> I've been literally. Okay, so the last four nights I've had painting dreams about quick finishes. I didn't even do a quick finish this year. <laughs> so they've been just nightmares. Like I have like four palettes set up and I have just giant piles of paint. I'm trying to like. I had an hour to go and I was trying to just dip into the burnt sand to get the wash in the background and I kept getting the white <laughs> and it was just like half hour and I hadn't even gotten the wash on and it was just like freaking out. It was not good. That's awful. It's, it's pretty bad. <laughs> anxiety. Yeah, I know. I got some major anxiety. It's performance problems. anxiety. <laughs> I'm sure you're not alone in that. <laughs> you don't get it, man. Did your brother do that like sound bath thing? Was that? Yeah. Were you there for that? Yeah, it was. Can you kind of describe I, it a little yeah, bit? I think it's interesting. I decided to stay a little longer for that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was very interesting. Uh, he had his own songs that he kind of wove into it. So like it was split into two halves. Um, this other guy, Daniel Blue, he's the singer for Moto Pony, and uh, they play uh, together cool. sometimes now because. Uh, his is more like kind of a rock and roll-ish type poppy band, but they're both more interested in doing more sonic scapes. Um, and they played also with this this uh, woman who has these huge like uh, bowls, large glass bowls, singing bowls, and like big dongs and stuff. And they just, you know, it's like in a church or something. <laughs> He's at the Fremont Abbey, which is kind of like a church. Oh, that's the venue. That's a really. Where's that at? in uh, Fremont, uh, in Seattle. Um, yeah, it's got a churchy vibe. I think it might have used to be a, used to be a church. I'm not sure. Right. But, uh, yeah, it's got really cool acoustics really in there. Acoustic. Uh, high ceiling. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah. And uh, so people came in and, you know, they brought their, you know, you had to bring your yoga mat. If you want to be comfortable, I guess you didn't have to. But, yeah. You know, they had complimentary yoga mat for those who didn't have one. Cool. It's kind of like all day? Or hmm? was it like a, a short performance? Or like yeah, it was, it, was like a, it was like a show. So okay. few hours. The whole thing was maybe like a couple hours. Okay. So my brother played the first half. I kind of did his songs. And in between his songs, there would be more, you know, uh, uh, sound making. Yeah, it was just really, really <coughs> cool. Like, by the end of it, I was almost asleep. A lot of people probably were as well. In a good way? It's just like the sound reverberating through. The vibration. Feel it in cutting into your soul. Yeah. Absolutely. That was really, cool. really nice and relaxing. And cool to see my brother do his thing, because he's, he's awesome. I'm a big fan of his music. Do you know that cat? Luke Williams. Luke Williams. Yeah, Luke Williams. Check him out. Check him out on you. He's got good stuff. What? Is he on Instagram or? Um, I guess yeah. Facebook. He's been working on recording the song, so he's gonna be having a uh, release pretty soon. We'll cool. We'll have to plug that later. Yeah. Did you know that cats the per the frequency that cats purr is uh, helps them heal. <laughs> the vib the vibration from their purring. That's uh, why people like cats. And healing. Well, healing themselves. I don't know that, that it helps with other people. It may. I heard that it helps people actually. That, well, I think any animal, like friendly animal contact, certainly helps. They do serve a purring. You actually are purring. <laughs> Just joking. Yeah. Purring helps. Yeah. It does something to your brain. <laughs> right. Yeah. Weird. Uh, it uh, it speeds their regeneration of tissue and things. I'm looking at my cats and like how they. Their meows are like meant to emulate. They figured out like at the, at the right frequency to 
talk to humans. That it, oh, it sounds like a like a baby, like a human oh, baby. Wow, that's cool. cry. So yeah. it kind of activates uh, that part of our brain. And cats it, don't it don't meow to each other. It's it's I think it's it evolved be. it from human and their human domestic domesticity. Right. Huh. Oh, that's kind of scary. Yeah. So. I never been with them. So they're I'm pleasurizing nice. babies. To bring it back to the yeah. topic. Wait, wait, wait. Pleasurizing baby. <laughs> the band name's <laughs> terrible. <laughs> Pleasurizing. <laughs> Pleasure. Pleasurism. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds a lot like pleasurism. Oh, you said, okay. But, 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 yeah, I'm trying to bring it back to the top. Interesting way to put that. <laughs> <laughs> a short gotcha. sonic intermission. I'm like, were you talking about that earlier? <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, that's interesting stuff. It is. Sound waves. I don't know, uh, speaking of babies, like I heard that babies in different like countries with different languages, they cry differently because of like the language. Right. There's a different emphasis on different sounds. Different tones. It's pretty it is. cool. <laughs> I've never heard them compared though. I'd be interested to hear, hear the comparison. It's notable. Like a, American baby and a Chinese baby. And therefore, I think it affects the cats. <laughs> right. <laughs> so a French cat sounds a lot different than an American More cat. Suave. <laughs> Crazy. More suave and judgy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> le meow. Le meow. Le peur. Le peur. <laughs> and that's, that's a pretty good impression. Yeah. <laughs> I should be using a way bigger brush right now. Uh -huh. Get that out. Yeah. Nice. Burnt orange. Burnt yellow, burnt orange, yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's see, I have to step back. Lauren, how are your uh, large format above the earth paintings? Come on. Cool. I'm slowly coming along. Lauren took a helicopter ride over a glacier, mm -hmm. Glacier National Park here in Montana, and took a bunch of photos, and now she's done. painting them. Yeah. <laughs> Which I can imagine would be difficult, because there's a lot of detail. And I don't know that we're, as humans, we're kind of hard to figure out what that view is. You know? Yeah, it's really ab kind of abstract. Right. Because of cool. The perspective. But yeah, they're coming along. How big are they? Five by four? That's no. That's big. Six, yeah. Five by four, six by five. Cool. No. Yeah, I don't know. I'm excited to see it. Sometime soon we'll host we'll host the podcast at Lauren's house. We'll check out our work. Yeah. Seems like it's too big to move. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, from the helicopter. Yeah. Pretty cool. Ah. <laughs> I thought it would be kind of loud. Oh, right. Oh, <laughs> man, I forgot about that. <laughs> How about doing the podcast outside today? It's gorgeous, but yeah, it's still a bit cold. Got a bluebird powder day up here in Whitefish, Montana. Oh, man. man. Don't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There's a constant sense of FOMO living <laughs> in a ski town. It's fear of missing out. Oh, yeah. FOMO. Yeah. It's, constant. it's pretty constant, especially when all your friends have like snowmobiles and stuff, and they they head out to the mountains and they get fresh tracks everywhere. I'm a FOMOPhobe. So. FOMOPhobe, good. Yeah. <laughs> I think I, I, I just want to live in the moment. Yeah, I don't want to think about what people yeah. are doing. No. <laughs> yeah, it's a good, it's a better way to live for sure. Yeah, well, as a homeschooler, you. Developed that, I think. <laughs> what, are, what are the cool kids in school doing right now? <laughs> I wish I had friends. <laughs> yeah. Mom, can I go to school? <laughs> yes. Turns out they weren't doing anything that cool, but yeah. Except drugs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and probably each other, and kids. <laughs> if they're lucky. I wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. We're theater kids. <laughs> I don't still like drive by high schools or anything. And <laughs> <laughs> no, well, that, was, that was a joke, people. <laughs> right, got, got, got. 
got quiet there. <laughs> we call it a joke. Well, see, then as the plagiarism discussion has, and you're a musician, mm-hmm. how is it kind of a, a part of your process, or do you, do you have to be aware of it like us artists have to be? Or you feel like it's pretty easy to be your own um, um, sound? For me, kind of. <laughs> I don't know. I think I've, pretty, I've developed my voice and I'm happy with it and I'm still, still doing it. But it's, I mean, it's kind of the same thing, really. I'm pretty parallel. It's just audio. Do you try so, to sound like somebody or do you? Um, like more that, the more that I like, uh, record myself and stuff. I find myself studying and listening to albums I like and the way people do, you know, mix certain sounds. Like, oh, I like the way, you know, guitars are like this, or like, oh, I want to sound. I want to get kind of an old uh, R&B sound, and you mm-hmm. kind of got emulate that. And, but just figuring out how to do all those things is a real challenge. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Same with training. Yeah. How do you yeah. like something? Right. Even even the the act of imitating something is pretty impressive. You know, it's not something that just anybody could do. You know? mm-hmm. I think like with music, if you listen, have listened to a lot of music coming up, it's just going to be inside you. Just like whatever you like, and then it's just, just going to come out. Yeah. And you can be like the type of person if you can like produce <clears throat> and just try to produce what you think people want to hear, what's popular and stuff, like same thing with like you know, you guys were talking about singers. The kind of famous that Ken doesn't want to be. Yeah. You know? So yeah. it's like it's the same scale and range as far as yeah, originality. Yeah. I think it's pretty much the same. <laughs> so you think people that are brought up in it have a I guess I'm not a harder time becoming hacks because they're going to automatically associate more of their identity to it or something. Because I've, I've noticed, like, I don't have, like, even though I've drawn a lot of different artists' work, I wouldn't say I'm too, oh, I there's a couple artists I'm getting pretty close to hacking. <laughs> but I don't, I, I try to avoid it really bad, but I just grew up drawing and painting a lot. So a lot of the people that take those workshops are retired people that did something else their whole life and then they, they want to be a painter and they really aspire to it, but they take that one class. And that's all they have really in their head, even. It seems like sometimes that's the case. I don't know. What's the line between like learning a method? Yeah. Learning a method and then. I think trying to sell it. Well, copying. Just... I think you can do whatever you want. You rest not trying to sell it. You know, like I think it's important to emulate, but like if you just rest in it and just like, yeah, that's, that's all I do. You know, like, you know, move on. And... I don't know. Like life is short. Play around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Get a little messy, like when I hear, like a singer, for example, that is really, really good and super talented. It's like, oh, awesome, but boring, kind of. You know, yeah. It's yeah. Impressive, but I don't, you know, rather mm-hmm. hear something that is sounds like it's from, you know, you can hear the person. Yeah. Cause I, yeah, <laughs> I think that's how you kind of start out. You're just trying to follow these rules that you've learned, and then you're kind mm-hmm. of balancing all these. You know, ideas and rules in your head Influence. when you're painting. Yeah, influences and then, and then it's slowly you become your own voice or your own method of painting or whatever. Not everybody kind of, goes that way. Some uh, people try to set out, you know, 100% their own, 100% original ideas from the get go. But I don't see it succeed. <laughs> I don't see those people having much success. Without yeah. learning the without learning the, the concept, the basic concepts yeah, first. You know, uh, Sia, right? Sia. Yeah. The singer. Yeah. No. She with the hair with the white and the black, and she's like got the wig, and it comes down over her eyes. Oh. I, would, I think I would <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so she um, she had her own career singing and stuff, and then it didn't. Well, she like listened to Rihanna and. Uh, a couple, maybe someone else, and like try to emulate. Well, she wrote all the songs. Yeah, songs. she like wrote a bunch of songs to sound just like them, and then sold it to them, <laughs> like made millions of dollars. And that's what got her. I can do on. you better than you. <laughs> yeah. 
Should be cool. I've heard that with country music, it's like that. That's how they just have big songwriting studios, and the country singers are just given songs that they sing. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone associated so much with that singer, but it's probably some guy. Yeah. Kind of weird. I, don't, I really don't like that very much. Yeah. But I do like it's a market for her. Yeah, I guess it's just marketing. I think it's cool she found her own thing, though. After that, like now she's coming to her own. and Yeah, that's pretty cool. How do you spell her name? S I A. Oh, I'm sure you've heard music. Probably. What's uh, I like the anonymity that she is doing. Like that's what I would probably ideally do. As far as producing behind the scenes, you mean? Uh, oh, just like um, as far as you know, being famous, like not what? being recognized and stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, she just says she has it when the cameras are around, basically. Right. A good way to do it. Yeah. Why people disguise themselves as characters so yeah. they can walk around and... It kind of reminds me of those... What are those French artists that, like, wrapped trees? Oh, yeah. What's um, his name? Jean-Michel or something? What is it? Jean-Michel? Is that... Jean-Michel. Jean-Michel something? No. That, like, Basquiat. That's, yeah. He's something, a yeah. painter. Right. I can't remember the guy... The, it's like a couple. It's a couple, yeah. But they did, like... They do these, like... A, like a canyon, they put a giant piece of fabric across the yeah. canyon, and like just on the orange gates or whatever. Yeah, Central Park. Makes it more conspicuous. So like, she's covering her face, but it kind of makes you want to know more. Right. But because mm-hmm. it's covered, mystery. You wouldn't notice it otherwise. Uh huh. Like, a second benefit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> What's behind door number two? The lawnmower is pretty nice, but I gotta find out what. <laughs> That's, I'm going for it. Yeah. Price is right. Yeah. Yeah. Let's make a deal. <laughs> the mystery. Cool. Well, I guess we figured it out. <laughs> what was that? That's the question I <laughs> Well, we just figured everything out. So That's it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We just reach out and pull the trigger. I'm not here. Are you judging me? I'm judging. Well, cool. We're about in an hour, so I think we'll call it. <laughs> I'm getting all caught in my painting here. Yeah, yeah. Too. yeah. I was caught. I'm so sure. easy. So easy to get excited about these things. But, yep, thank you. We'll try to not be plagiarizing anything. Right. Keep creating. Be original. See you guys in a week or so. Yeah. Mm-hmm.